The stage has been set for the Battle of Bannockburn. As King Robert's forces are besieging one of the last strongholds held by the English, Stirling Castle. King Edward II is marching with a huge army to relieve the castle in the spring of 1314. James Douglas reported to King Robert that the English army was the largest he'd ever seen. Robert explained the news to his soldiers by saying that the English were marching all over the place like scattered sheep, thus keeping his troops in good spirits. The English army had been slow to assemble and were force marching towards Stirling. Records show the English baggage train was 110 wagons, a significant number that slowed the English advance. And by the 19th of June, the English arrived at Edinburgh and rested for two days before force marching to Stirling. They made no attempt to take Edinburgh Castle. King Edward finally arrived on the 23rd of June 1314. The location of the actual battle site is unknown and still debatable. However, the Roman road in the forest around Stirling was blocked by the Scots, as they had set traps and wooden stakes along the road. The bulk of the English army arrived about a mile from Bannockburn, and Edward ordered a war council to discuss a strategy. But the Earls of Hereford and Gloucester either ignored Edward's command or simply didn't receive it, as they saw the Scots getting into formation and decided to attack, as Hereford's nephew, Sir Henry de Bouin, saw King Robert as he was wearing a gold crown atop his helmet and charged straight for Robert. King Robert saw Henry charging towards him and decided to meet the challenge. As Henry's lance came bearing down, Robert managed to avoid the lance due to his horse being much lighter and then struck the young knight on the head with such force that Robert's axe split in two. The English vanguard then clashed with the Scottish Skiltrum, and thanks to Robert having drilled his men into holding their formation days before, the Scots gradually started to push back the English, who then withdrew from the melee. The Scots did not pursue them, as Robert had installed discipline into his troops. With the main road blocked with pits and traps and the Scots holding firm, Edward sought to flank the Scots and sent Robert Clifford with 300 mounted men-at-arms to relieve Stirling Castle, as the castle garrison would be useful in trapping the Scots. Clifford then moved his troops over the Bannockburn and kept well away from the forest to avoid attacks from the Scots' position there. Yet they were quickly spotted by one of Robert's lieutenants, Randolph, who was stationed in the forest nearest to Stirling Castle. Randolph waited until Clifford's forces were far enough away from reinforcements to reach them, and then ordered his men to charge from out the forest, but before engaging the English, Randolph ordered his men to reform back into their Skiltrum. As the Scots were not as nimble as the English cavalry, Clifford could have ignored the Scots and charged straight to Stirling Castle, but instead, he ordered his men to charge. But after a few charges and finding little success, the frustrated cavalry began to throw their weapons at the Scots. Seeing the action from afar, James Douglas asked Robert's permission to aid Randolph, yet Robert initially refused, as he felt the Roman road still needed protecting. Yet James convinced Robert, and soon his forces moved down from their encampment and attacked the engaged English cavalry. This action was enough for the English to break off, and as they regrouped, Randolph ordered his men to push into the English ranks, driving a wedge between them. This caused Clifford's men to break off into two directions. Some galloped towards Stirling Castle, and the rest back to the English camp. With the skirmish over, the day drew to a close. The Scots remained in their position around the forest, and Edward ordered his men to make camp near the Bannock, a boggy terrain with heavy clay soil, not an ideal place for resting troops, while the baggage trains were sent a mile south of the main camp. As the night went on, the English were restless. The Scots only being a mile away made the likelihood of a night attack highly possible, so the English had no choice but to stay awake and maintain formation. 
Edward's plan of camping in this location was that if Robert tried to break camp and retreat, then Edward's forces could perhaps pursue Robert and force him into an open battle. As Edward concluded, Robert would not want to engage him, given the two to one advantage Edward had over Robert in troop numbers. At the Scottish camp, Robert gave a rousing speech to his men over their determination in the day's fighting. Later in the night, a lone rider arrived at the camp. That man was Alexander Seaton. Alexander was a Scottish landowner who had accepted Edward's offer of peace a few years ago, but now he had deserted the English camp and brought the news to Robert that the English morale was low and explained how unorganised the camp was and that if the Scots attacked tomorrow, the day would be theirs. Robert had been planning on falling back towards the southwest of Stirling in an effort to wear down the English army, but now, presented with a golden opportunity, Robert asked his men what they should do, and they shouted back to fight. Then, at 4am the next day, the Scots marched out from the cover of the forest, and as they reached the open plains, they formed into their Skiltrum formation. The Scots' plan to fight surprised Edward, and he hastily began to organise his men into battle formation. Despite spending the night armed, only the Earl of Gloucester's contingent was ready, but not the Earl himself, as he didn't even have time to put on his distinctive surcoat. And while the English were desperately trying to get ready for battle, the Scots then stopped to kneel and pray. Edward was bewildered and asked for counsel from his earls and lords. Gloucester suggested delaying, as the troops were tired, and as they could see the Scots, they could rest a good portion of the troops. Edward reacted angrily and called Gloucester a traitor. Offended, Gloucester proclaimed he would prove himself loyal on the battlefield. The opening phase of the battle began with the English and Welsh longbowmen skirmishing with the Scottish longbowmen. But as the battlefield was narrow, the archers were packed between the Palstream Burn in the north and Bannockburn in the south, which left them in an exposed position, vulnerable to a cavalry charge. Yet the English archers' line of fire was disrupted by the rash charge of Gloucester's unit, as the young Earl was reckless and eager to prove himself, yet this impulsive charge ended when Gloucester's unit clashed with Edward Bruce's Skiltrum. Gloucester was dead not long after impact, along with Robert Clifford. With the English knights stopped in their tracks and with no room to manoeuvre, they could do little to stop the advancing Scots, and with their horses being cut down, the knights were helpless as the English infantry were marching behind them, effectively trapping the knights as more fell to the Scottish pikes. Seeing the English knights decimated, King Edward ordered his archers to fire into the Scottish left, but before they could make an impact, the archers were routed by the Scottish light cavalry led by Robert Keith. King Edward's blunder of leaving his archers exposed would cost him dearly, as they were his best option in breaking the Scottish Skiltrum. With heavy fighting underway, as the Scottish Skiltrum began pushing further into the English ranks, Robert sought to end the battle by sending his own divisions of Skiltrum into the main line to support James Douglas and push through the English centre. The English started to give ground as the Scots pushed their pikes and spears further into the English ranks as they were gradually being pushed towards the boggy terrain. Defeat seemed certain and with the push from Robert's fresh troops, the English line began to falter. Sensing defeat, the Earl of Pembroke grabbed King Edward's horse's reins and dragged the King from the battle. The royal escort then fought through the Scots and fled towards Stirling Castle, but were turned away and had to flee to Linlithgow before catching a ship from Dunbar to Berwick, whilst being harassed by James Douglas. The rest of the English army fled in all directions, with many drowning in the streams and ditches. The victory at Bannockburn pushed the English out of Scotland and enabled King Robert to pillage the north of England. 
and with many English nobles captured, Robert managed to trade them for the release of his wife, sisters and daughter. The war was now at a stalemate and would continue with a few more battles, but nothing like the scale of Bannockburn. The Scots would attempt an invasion of Ireland, King Edward II would be overthrown in 1327 in favour of his young son, Edward III, and peace would be achieved with the Treaty of Edinburgh Northampton in 1328. Yet the peace treaty would create a class of nobles known as the Disinherited, leading to another war in 1332. Thank you so much for watching our documentaries on the Scottish War of Independence. If you would like to support the channel, we now have a Patreon. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next documentary.